Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for a release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1152 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The FCC is not yet collecting that pesky $35 application fee, we will have all the details for you. Amateur Radio gets a temporary partial reprieve on the 3.5 gigahertz band. We will have all the details you need to know. A cooperative effort is underway between the Department of Defense, the FCC, and the ARRL to resolve a potential 70 centimeter band interference issue on the White Sands Missile Range. Hams in the UK get a preview of their new license document. SpaceX's Starlink network proposes to raise its download goal from 1 gig to 10 gigabits. We will have the story. The National Council of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators Question Pool Committee is seeking input for the updated technician question pool. The FCC wants to know how bad your internet service sucks. We will have the details. World Amateur Radio Day is coming up next month. The International Amateur Radio Union is facing up to the task of deciding the future of amateur radio. And you can celebrate radio of yesteryear during the Novice Rig Roundup. We will tell you all the details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will visit what he calls the other side of hacking and talks about older computing and about the Internet Archive. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, visits the remote edge this week. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill visits the dual ladder licensing proposal the FCC put forth in 1974. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about how to work successfully on tower side arms. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, this week in amateur radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our UV lit and disinfected headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau, just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our springtime radio station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. Spring has sprung, the grass is riz. I wonder where the flowers is. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the spring showers are upon us already, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. We have some late-breaking news as we come to air this week in a press release from Frederick Chauvin. There will be no get-together in 2021. The ham radio exhibition is once again suspended. This year, as well, the coronavirus pandemic is maintaining a firm grip on world events. Due to current developments regarding the spread of COVID-19, Massé Frederick Chauvin has been forced to make a very difficult decision. The Ham Radio International Amateur Radio Exhibition will not take place in the planned time frame of June 25th through the 27th, 2021, but instead will be held from June 24th to the 26th, 2022. It was not an easy decision for us. However, an exhibition like Ham Radio depends on a high level of international participation. Due to the current uncertainties in the travel sector, it is simply not feasible to hold it this year explained Klaus Wellman, CEO of Massey Frederick Schaben. Project manager Petra Rathgeberger also expressed her great disappointment. It is deeply regrettable that the event cannot take place as planned. We were so looking forward to a get-together with the industry. Christian Netschelter, chairman of the German Amateur Radio Club, DARC, added, added that we support the decision of Massey Frederick Schaben to cancel this year's ham radio exhibition at this early date. 
Naturally, we are very disappointed that our meeting with friends in Frederikshavn will not take place after all. However, the online version of Ham Radio that is now planned to take place from June 25th to the 27th, 2021, is a consolation that we are very much looking forward to as it will offer our members of Ham Radio Friends some interesting surprises. Exhibitors, visitors, and participating partners are currently being notified about these changes. For more information, you can visit them on the web at www.messe-frederickshaven.de. And now, with this week's lead story, here's Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Dave? The majority of the FCC's revised Part 97 rules adopted in December 2020, establishing new application fees, become effective on April 19th. But the new amateur radio application fees will not become effective on April 19th. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with more. The FCC announced on March 19th that the new fees would not become effective until Congress has been notified, the FCC's information technology systems and internal procedures have been updated, and the FCC publishes the notices in the Federal Register announcing the effective date, which is expected to be by this summer. The $35 fee would apply to new modification, as are upgrade and sequential call sign changes, renewal and vanity call sign applications, as well as applications for a special temporary authority or a rule waiver. All fees would be per application. Administrative updates, such as a change of mailing address, emailing address, or name, are exempt. Once the FCC application fee takes effect, new and upgrade applicants will pay the $15 exam session fee to the VE team, as usual, and pay the $35 application fee directly to the FCC. ARRL will post specifics on our website when the time comes. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. It is expected that such fees will not become effective before summer 2021. The FCC has stated that amateurs will have advance warning of the actual effective date because it will publish such date in the Federal Register. ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator Manager Maria Soma, AB1FM, said VECs and volunteer examiner teams will not have to collect the $35 fee at exam sessions. Soma said this information was provided in a VE newsletter distributed this past week. Further news and instructions will follow when we have them, she said. The FCC exempted the fee applications for administrative updates, such as a change of mailing or email address. The FCC proposed a schedule of application and other fees for all services last year. Pending future FCC action, amateur radio secondary use of the 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz band segment may continue indefinitely. With more details, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. The FCC is part of a lengthy second report and order for commercial licensing of 3.45 to 3.55 gigahertz adopted on March 17th, agreed with ARRL that continued access by amateur radio to 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz should be allowed until consideration of the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz segment in a later proceeding. The FCC action represents a partial and temporary reprieve from the FCC's December 2019 proposal to remove amateur radio from the entire band. And it makes available an additional 50 MHz than last fall's FCC proposal to give HAMS temporary use of 3.3 to 3.4 GHz. Amateur radio secondary operation in the 3.45 to 3.5 gigahertz band must cease 90 days after public notice that the spectrum auction has closed and licensing has begun. That is expected to happen early in 2022. The FCC advised amateur operators not to expect more than a short period of notice before operations must cease. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. 
The FCC stated that while we adopt our proposal to bifurcate the band, we adjust our proposal and set 3450 megahertz as the frequency at which the band will be split. It agreed with the ARRL's assessment that the guard band is not necessary from a technical standpoint. We also recognize that the nature of amateur equipment realities makes the 50 MHz at 3400 to 3450 MHz particularly valuable to amateur operators because it means existing equipment can continue to operate in the band for the time being. This allows amateur operators to continue in the lower portion of the band while the FCC and federal government users continue to analyze whether that spectrum can be reallocated for flexible use, the FCC said. The Commission had proposed splitting the band at 3.4 GHz, permitting amateur use in 100 MHz of spectrum, while also providing a buffer to protect flexible use operations at the lower edge of the 3.45 GHz band. We therefore allow secondary amateur operations to continue in the 3.4 to 3.45 GHz portion of the band, the FCC said. We emphasize, however, that amateur licensees remain secondary users and those that operate on frequencies close to the 3450 MHz band edge must do so with a particular caution to avoid causing harmful interference to flexible use licenses in the 3.45 GHz service which hold primary status. In the light of these considerations, while amateur operations between 3450 MHz and 3500 MHz must cease within 90 days of the public notice announcing the close of the auction for the 3.45 GHz service, as specified in the report and order, amateur operations may continue between 3300 MHz and 3450 MHz while the Commission, the NTIA, and the Department of Defense continue to analyze whether that spectrum can be reallocated for commercial wireless use. There is no expectation that such operations will be accommodated in future planning for commercial wireless operations in this spectrum or that amateur operators will receive more than a short period of notice before their operations must cease, the FCC said. The ARRL, the FCC, and the U.S. Department of Defense are cooperating in an effort to eliminate the possibility of amateur radio interference on 70 centimeters to critical systems at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The Defense Department's Regional Spectrum Coordinator contacted the FCC in March, seeking information on whom to contact regarding detected amateur transmissions, it's believed, which could pose a critical threat to the White Sands Missile Range operating on 70 centimeters. The FCC in turn asked the RRL to be involved in the discussion and any necessary remedial efforts. It's to be noted that the amateur radio service is a secondary service on that band. Investigation revealed that the potential problem was not with individual operators or repeaters, but with RF control links at 420 and 430 megahertz used to establish a linked repeater system within New Mexico. Based on the investigation and with the support of the FCC, the owners of the RF control links being used in the 420 to 430 portion of the band within a certain proximity to White Sands are being asked to re-coordinate the link frequency to a new one above 430 MHz. The ARRL enlisted the assistance of the state's designated repeater frequency coordinator for information on the specific links in that part of the band. New Mexico repeater frequency coordinator Bill Kaufman, W5YEJ, agreed to work with the control link operators to find new frequencies that will meet the needs of the link operators. Time is a factor in the request, Henderson said. The new systems at the White Sands Missile Range are now in advanced testing and will become fully operational by early summer of 2021. The FCC has imposed a deadline for the affected control links to change frequencies, and that's set for May 31st of this year. It appears that a total of 32 control links will have to be addressed. EWRL has mailed letters to each of the RF link control operators based on the record keeping of the frequency coordinator to advise them of the Department of Defense request. Any links with the potential to affect the identified systems at White Sands, still in operation after May 31st, will be subject to action by the FCC. Henderson said the changes should have no direct impact on the use of any local repeaters, but until all the affected RF control links are transitioned to new frequencies, certain links may be temporarily inoperative. Links unable to be relocated by May 31st will have to be shut down until the situation can be resolved. ARRL will be in contact with the FCC after the May 31st deadline to advise it of the status of the remediation effort. 
During 2021, the German radio telegraphy High Speed Club, the HSC, is celebrating its 70th anniversary. To mark this event, HSC was granted the special DOK number HSC70 to be used by its club stations, Delta Alpha Zero, Hotel Sierra Charlie, and Delta Kilo Zero, Hotel Sierra Charlie, throughout the year. And the special call sign Delta Papa 70 Hotel Sierra Charlie has been assigned to HSC to be activated exclusively on CW. It will also use the special DOK number HSC 70 and its HSC number is 1951, which is the year when the HSC was founded. Throughout 2021, this station can be operated by any German HSC member upon special application. QSL is via the Bureau or Logbook of the World. For further information, visit the HSC website at www.highspeedclub.org. You click on the Union flag to view the page in English. Hams in the United Kingdom can get a preview of what the new amateur radio license will look like by visiting the website of Ofcom. It is available there in draft form and comments are being accepted until the 18th of April. The new license will become effective on the 18th of May and contains a number of changes, including details about electromagnetic field exposure compliance. The EMF wording has been somewhat controversial among some amateurs who consider its inclusion unnecessary. Ofcom have also opted to delete the reference to the old full reciprocal license that was abolished in 2016. SpaceX has announced that it is aiming to one day deliver 10 gigabit internet speeds over its satellite internet system, Starlink. That is a tenfold increase over the company's previous one gigabit goal. Last week, SpaceX gave an update to the FCC on the current status of Starlink, which is already supplying broadband to residents in rural areas in the U.S., Canada, and the United Kingdom. The company's presentation points out the system can currently deliver 100 megabit download speeds to its users, but the long-term goal is to upgrade speeds to 10 gigabits. If the company can pull it off, Starlink would be faster than many ground-based gigabit broadband networks and thus create some serious competition in the ISP market. When exactly SpaceX plans on reaching the new speed goal was left unsaid but it'll hinge on building out its Starlink satellite network. Currently, the system numbers at only 955 satellites, but the long-term goal is to launch thousands more to enable global coverage and faster internet speeds. According to SpaceX's presentation to the FCC, the company is working to launch 120 satellites each month. Upcoming software updates also promise to accelerate Starlink's throughput. The presentation goes on to ask for FCC approval to lower Starlink satellites to an operating altitude of 540 kilometers above the planet instead of its current 570. According to SpaceX, the lower altitude will make the satellites safer to operate by improving the debris profile. However, the company says competitors, such as Amazon, have been objecting to the change over claims Starlink will interfere with their own satellite broadband systems. According to SpaceX, since being granted its own license by the FCC, Amazon has engaged in a continuous campaign to undermine authorizations from competitors. Company CEO Elon Musk also contends Amazon's own system is several years away from launching. If you'd like to try out Starlink, you can go to the company's website to register for the public beta. However, the invites remain limited to users in select regions in the northern U.S. The company plans to widen the beta to the southern U.S. later this year. The National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators Question Pool Committee is requesting input from the amateur radio community on new or modified questions for the 2022 to 2026 FCC Element 2 Technician Pool, which goes into effect on July 1, 2022. With more details on how you can submit changes to the upcoming Technician Question Pool release, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. Suggestions for new questions, changes to current examination topic areas, or changes to existing questions in the current technician question pool are invited. 
The question pool committee said it wants input that focuses on topics and subjects that enhance public interest, understanding, and use of amateur radio, or that focus on STEM hands-on learning and education. Also, questions on new technology, digital modes, station setup and operation, antennas, and emergency and non-emergency operation. The committee asks that questions have no more than two 70-character lines, including spaces. Distractors should be no more than two 70-character lines long, shorter if possible. Each multiple-choice question must be accompanied by four possible distractors, those are wrong answers, and only one correct answer. Provide the resource information or the FCC Part 97 rule that supports the correct answer. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The Question Pool Committee will accept question comments, revisions, and submissions from the amateur radio community via email through June 30th, 2021. This email address is a bulk forwarding mailbox, so no acknowledgement will be sent by return mail. The National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators Question Pool Committee will take all comments into consideration as it updates the Technician Question Pool for 2022 to 2026. The FCC announced today that it started soliciting first-hand accounts from people who are forced to rely on crappy internet. This new initiative is part of the FCC's broadband data collection program and the agency hopes that by collecting information directly from consumers, it will be better equipped to enhance the accuracy of its existing broadband maps. Far too many Americans are left behind in the access to jobs, education, and health care if they do not have access to broadband, acting FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said in a statement announcing the initiative. Collecting data from consumers who are directly affected by the lack of access to broadband will help inform the FCC's mapping efforts and future decisions about where service is needed. The new webpage, FCC.gov slash broadband data, explains the FCC's program and provides direct links to consumer resources, including a new Share Your Broadband Experience option. Anyone who wants to tell the FCC about how bad their internet sucks can use this form to talk about any internet-related woes. ISPs throttling your internet? Write it down. ISPs won't upgrade your ancient DSL service? Write it down. Don't have internet at all because you live in a rural area and satellite internet is too expensive? Write it all down. The FCC says this new website will also become an informational hub for the broadband data collection program, a sort of one-stop shop for consumers and industry stakeholders to keep tabs on what's happening in the world of home internet. And once the FCC has collected enough personal anecdotes, the agency will provide information on its yet-to-be-established new broadband data collection reporting systems. On one hand, this seems like a refreshing change of pace compared to how the FCC did things under the previous administration. But at the same time, there's always loads of anecdotal evidence out there about how the nation's broadband coverage and speeds are lacking. The media, various organizations, and data companies have already reported on the situation, and those reports would point the FCC in the right direction. Broadband Now, for instance, has an in-depth map showing every census block in the U.S. that does not have terrestrial broadband provider. Fixing the reporting loophole in Form 477, which allowed ISPs to report that an entire census block was covered by their service, even if only one home in that census block actually subscribed to the service, was a start, but the FCC used that flawed data as a basis for ISPs to bid in its Rural Digital Opportunity Fund auction last year, which prompted municipal broadband providers and electric co-ops to question if the grant money went to the right companies. Not to mention, previous auction winners haven't been able to provide rural America with internet in the time frame they said they would. There's also a bit of irony in directing those who are directly affected by the lack of access to broadband to an online form as the sole means of telling the FCC how the lack of access to broadband affects their lives. That website, once again, is FCC.gov slash broadband data. After an eight-year wait, a new amateur radio decree has been published in the French government's official journal. The most significant change involves the way amateur radio exams are graded. 
France has one amateur radio exam, which is the equivalent to the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administrations, H-A-R-E-C, or Harmonized Amateur Radio Examination Certificate, or all three UK exams combined. The French H-A-R-E-C exam comprises of 40 questions to be completed in 45 minutes, with 15 minutes allowed for the 20 rules and regulations questions, and 30 minutes for the 20 technical theory questions. How these exams are graded it was unusual, with three points given for a correct answer, but one point deducted for each wrong answer. Under the new rules regime, candidates will receive one point for a correct answer, and no credit for wrong answers. To pass, a candidate must get at least 50% of the questions correct in both sections of the exam. Questions involving digital signal processing are also being added to the exam, and some changes will be made relating to call signs. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I used to listen to them when I was a kid. From a lot of my life, my early life, and that's probably why I got into radio, I used to... Uh, lie in bed late at night and listen to the radio. Did you do that? I used to listen to baseball games. I remember in 1969, I was lying in bed and uh, we lived in Rhode Island and I was hearing about all the kids. I was 13. I was hearing all about the ki all the kids going up to Woodstock, how the roads were jammed. And I was thinking, I wish I were going to Woodstock. And I used to, you'd have to do it at night because uh, you, could, oh, you couldn't quite get it, but I used to tune in WOR in New York and listen to Gene Shepard late at night. Great, the great radio legend. Then later, uh, when I was in college, I would actually get up, and this is for a college kid, unusual. I would get up at six in the morning, didn't have class, but I wanted to listen to Imus in the morning on uh, WNBC. And Reverend Billy Saul Hargis and all of the characters he used to do in that. But I think that's, you know what, now that I think about it, that's probably why I got into this business. Somebody once said, maybe it was me, I don't remember now, technology is anything that wasn't around when you were born. So if you grew up with buttons, when the zipper came out, whoa, high tech. Actually, it is. If you think about it, a zipper is pretty, a pretty cool invention. But in this case, we're pretty much sticking to the tech that has uh, microprocessors in it. You know, anything with a chip in it, sometimes I say microprocessors would be more accurate. Those thinking machines we call computers. Uh, the Internet is, is not a thinking machine, but it is made up of computers. So I guess the Internet. Certainly your smartphone is a computer, your smartwatch. Uh, home theater, that's high tech these days. Didn't used to be. Used to be tubes. But again, if you grew up, if you grew up in, uh, you know, the late 19th century, uh, an airplane. Ooh, wow. Would be high tech. I just read a great biography of the Wright Brothers by David McCullough. And for at least three years after they first flew there at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina on the beach there, People didn't believe it. They said, no, you didn't fly. You liars. You're making that up. Even though there were eyewitnesses and pictures, they didn't believe it. Oh, nobody. Man cannot fly. Nobody believed it. It took uh, three years and a very, very public demonstration before uh, the, anybody believed that the Wright brothers had invented the airplane. So that's there's that. Anything invented after your birth. Actually, I, that's not... So that's, I guess, not even a good measure either, because uh, even though I was born a long time ago, computers had already been invented uh, shortly after World War II. Maybe even during World War II, there were tube-based computers calculating artillery trajectories and things like that. So, but, you know, things that became prominent after you became aware of things going on in the world, because that's n the new, is what I guess I'm saying. The new stuff is high tech. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of new stuff, man, no matter even if you were born in the 90s or the are there people born in the 2000s? I guess there are even <laughs> there are actual adults born in the 2000s. Even if you were born that recently, there there are things that you go, wow, like self-driving cars, right? Wow. There's new tech all the time. This augmented virtual reality stuff. That's that's pretty interesting, pretty exciting. But we hear so much about hacking. It's kind of. Um, I think important to, to tell the other end of the story. What happens if they get caught? Because that might help discourage some hacking. A young man, he was only 17 years old when he hacked Twitter. You remember this Twitter hack a few, what one was it? It was like a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, where uh, all of a sudden famous people 
like Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Elon Musk, Kanye West, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Mike Bloomberg, Warren Buffett, the boxer Floyd Mayweather, the internet sensation Kim Kardashian, and even companies like Apple and Uber all tweeted on the Twitter, hey, I want to give back. Apple tweeted, this is pretty much what they all said, we want to give back to our community. We support Bitcoin and believe you should too. All Bitcoin sent to our address below will be sent back to you doubled. Send me money and I'll double it and send it back to you. Now, I think most of us looking at that would go, um, that sounds fishy. <laughs> In fact, I think most people did. But, uh, you know, hey, it's a teenager. We, you know, when it happened, we were speculating, what is going on? This is either a hack, a kind of an unsophisticated hacking ring, because if they, if you were able to tweet from Apple's account, I think there are other things you could do that might be more useful. Or Barack Obama's account. There, you know, if it were the Russians, you know, imagine. There's all sorts of things. But to do kind of a, <laughs> a weak scam, hey, send me money, I'll double it and send it back to you. That's, well, you know, it had all the earmarks of a teenager. We just couldn't believe it. Well, it turned out it was. At least he's been convicted now. Sentenced as a youthful offender, which, because he was 17 when he did it, he's 18 now, which if he would have got a 10-year, minimum 10-year sentence if he were an, an adult. So he's going to go to basically juvie, a prison designed for young adults uh, for just for three years. Nevertheless, probably no walk in the park. Kid was from Tampa. I'm not going to say his name because, uh, you know, I don't, I think, you know, he could be rehabilitated and go on to it. In fact, chances are good. Some company will snap him up saying, well, you got skills, man. <laughs> we could use a guy like you. It seems to happen a lot with hackers. In this case, he really didn't have that many skills. The hack, once you figured it out, wasn't that brilliant. Really, it was Twitter's own stupidity that made it possible. <sighs> so, um, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's like a boot camp. He's like, hey, go to boot camp for three years. President Joe Biden. It was not the president yet when he tweeted, I'm giving back to the community. All Bitcoin will be doubled. If you send a thousand, I'll send back two thousand. Only doing this for thirty minutes. Enjoy. You know, with all of that, and the, and I think some people might go, Oh yeah, that sounds good. I'll do it. With all of that, I think the uh, account that he uh, used. See, this is the problem with Bitcoin is you know you publish that account number once it's traced back to you. You know, we know you did it. I don't know if that's how they caught him, but we could also look. Anybody can look who has a Bitcoin wallet could look and see how much money went into that account. It was about a hundred. I think a hundred some thousand dollars. It wasn't very much. I mean, well, it's a lot, but some people were fooled. $117,000. And then it was shut down. He was a student in high school. <laughs> Arrested days later at his home. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement found he accessed Twitter's system. This is the mad skills he had. By convincing an employee, he worked in the IT department. The employee then gave him enough information so he could access the company's customer service portal and that was enough to allow him to tweet so in other words twitter really didn't have very good controls i seem to remember that in fact what happened is the he convinced the employee was the it department got the employee's slack login logged in and found pinned in the slack you know that's the company messaging system we use it company messaging system have found pinned at the top there the login credentials for the customer service portal i guess people forget it so we'll just put it right at the top there everybody can get access to it including people who managed to hack their way in so i hope twitter's improved their uh, system and uh, i hope you've learned your lesson young man you're coming to the principal's office uh he was uh, he had some helpers and they are also charged with federal crimes we'll see Wait for it. My Google's booting up. Why does it do that? I don't know. It's been, re it's been, it's in a boot loop. I'll have to unplug it again. Here's something completely useless. Do you remember the old days of booting your computer? Uh, you put a floppy drive in and it would go, <laughs> and then it, would, it was reading in what we call a master boot record, a little tiny portion of the disk that contained. Just a few instructions on how to go from here. Go look on the hard drive. There's an operating system there, that kind of thing. Yes, you're a computer. Good morning. <laughs> well, somebody, it was crazy. I don't know why they would do this, but somebody 
has uh, Boggin Jr., B-O-G-I-N-J-R dot com, has decided that instead of a floppy or a USB or a boot DVD or a hard drive, what if we could boot from a vinyl record? <laughs> Booting from a record player, connected a, a, a PC to a record player through an amplifier. On the record, they recorded the sound of a, we call a bootloader. Same thing that's on the master boot record, a small ROM bootloader. It actually requires, in order to do this, you have to have the original IBM PC, which used a, we could boot to a cassette. And that cassette was audio. If you ever, did you ever listen to the cassette? You know, if you can't boot from the floppy, you can't boot from the hard drive. On these IBM PCs, they say, well, I don't know, is there a cassette? The turntable spins an analog recording of a small, bootable, read-only RAM drive, 64K, containing free DOS, which is a basically a free version of the old DOS operating system. You know, he had to, he had to really squeeze it down to get it in there. Command.com. <laughs> Remember that? Command.com. Remember that? The bootloader reads the disk image from the audio recording through the cassette modem, loads it to memory, and boots up. Why would you do that? If you ask, if you have to ask that question, <laughs> I'm curious what this sounds like. Yeah, yeah. There's the uh, uh, trying to get to the uh, the hard drive, and I guess the the turntable's now turning on. And the, it says needle on the record. Oh, it actually has an instruction that says, all right, now, because you, you have to do this manually, put the needle on the record. <laughs> Start it up. And the record, which says DOS boot disk on it, apparently it's all it needs to play the special sounds. Wait, wait, I don't know. Can you hear that? That's crazy. I shouldn't play that on the air. Because probably somebody somewhere is booting up. <laughs> Sounds a little like that sound that the modems used to make. The sound of data. That's kind of what this show is about. It's crazy, kooky, wild technology stuff. We also talk about the real world. You know, the uh, Flash. Flash. That's the real world. Not Flash Gordon. Flash, you know, the thing that made those jumping monkeys and the, you know, the punch the monkey and all the animations on the internet for years and years. It's gone, you know. It's over. End of life this year. This is so, so bye-bye, Flash. Probably a good thing. It was full of bugs. It caused, you know, in endless security problems. It was fat, so it slowed computers down. It, at the beginning of the end was more than a decade ago when Steve Jobs said, we're not going to put Flash in the iPhone. And then later the iPad. We're not going to do it. That was the beginning of the end. Well, if you want to see Flash, you don't need to have Flash in your system, which is good because most systems no longer support it. But you can... Go to this wonderful place, I hope you know about it, called the Internet Archive, where they are saving bits of the Internet, which is a good idea if you think about it. In a way, for the last 20 years, much of our history, our conversations, things we were talking about, thinking about doing, happened on websites, on the Internet, right? But they eventually, they go away. People made them, shut them down, give up on them. They become cobwebbed and dusty and eventually disappear. So the Internet Archive has, for that last 20 years, been just kind of scouring the Internet and saving this stuff so that there's a record. It's really a very cool idea. And now they have a Flash showcase where there are more than a 1,000 Flash animations. It, it's kind of fun because they're just out of context. They don't explain themselves. They don't. You can pick them by year, going all the way back to uh, 2000. 20 years ago, you can uh, pick it by subject matter, creator, language, Badger Badger. Remember Badger Badger? Badger Badger lives on on the Internet Archive. It's archive.org if you're curious. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy.
Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. The Finnish Amateur Radio League, SRAL, is celebrating its 100th anniversary, and a special award is available. Finland is a small, modern republic of 5 million inhabitants, located on the very northern frontier of Europe. Finns live life between the East and the West, belonging to the Alliance of the European Union. The strength of the National Amateur Radio Society lies in having one of the highest membership percentages among the IARU Region 1 membership societies. So, all of the OHs are welcoming you to their centennial year activity. All you have to do is contact 100 of your OH friends during 2021 and 10 specially featured Finnish stations to earn the OH Northern Light 100 Year Certificate and you'll also receive material explaining the magic of Finland and the Northern Lights. Your 100 contacts should include 50 OH stations and 50 OF stations, a total of 100. The special Oscar Foxtrot prefix will be made available to all Finnish amateur radio stations from September the 15th this year. There are 10 special activity multipliers. SRAL and its members are active in a wide range of amateur radio activities, and each of the 10 multipliers represents some of those activities. The multiplying stations are listed on the SRAL website at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Finland, and you can find out a lot more about the celebrations there too. Some of the special call signs are certainly worthy of note, including a dedicated Youth on the Air Yota station and an expedition to Oscar Juliet Market Reef. So, multiplying your QSO points, a maximum of 100, by your multiplier value, a maximum of 10, will give you your score. In other words, a maximum of 1,000 points. And all who score 1,000 points and the top 10 continental high scorers will receive their certificates signed by Santa Claus. A special lottery will feature additional special prizes. This will be announced later. Your log extract should be sent to the Santa Claus office at Oscar Foxtrot 9 X-Ray at sral.fi during January 2022. The same address will answer all questions relating to this centennial activity. As the SRAL news release says, just jump into Santa's sleigh and go for a thousand points and greet your fellow OHs along the way. Good luck and see you on the way to Cycle 25. Just as they did in 2016 and 2019, amateur radio operators in West Bengal, India, are assisting at polling stations in remote locations to help with reporting votes to the Election Commission. The Commission has accepted the offer from the West Bengal Radio Club to relay results in areas lacking a strong mobile communications network. The HAMS involvement recently won approval from the Wireless Planning and Communication Wing of the Department of Telecommunications located within the Ministry of Communications. Amateur radio is regulated by the Ministry. According to the Club Secretary, Ambarish Nagbiswa, VU2JFA, 30 hams will be deployed to a total of 130 polling stations in the Sundarbans area, which is a remote part of Bengal. They will be using the special call sign AU2ECI between March 29th through to April 1st. All the participants assisting with the communications have received training from the Indian Academy of Communication and Disaster Management. Votes are to be counted on May 2nd. In our last installment, we took a look at the new dual ladder licensing system proposed by the FCC late in 1974. In effect, there would be two parallel series of amateur radio licenses, with 29 megahertz as the line of demarcation. Series A covered the frequencies below 29 megahertz and included the novice, general, advanced, and extra classes. The conditional class would be abolished. Extra and advanced classes received a power increase. The advanced class would get access to the extra phone bands and generals would lose power, frequencies, certain modes of operation and the ability to be a trustee of a club station or a repeater. Series B covered the frequencies above 29 MHz and included two new license classes. 
the communicator, which would be FM only above 144 megahertz, and the experimenter, which would offer all amateur privileges above 29 megahertz. Like generals, technicians would lose big. In fact, those who took their exam by mail, or over 90%, would not be allowed to renew. Reaction to the proposal was strong, but somewhat puzzling. Instead of a vehement output of negative comments from the 180,000 general, conditional, and technician class amateurs who stood to lose substantial privileges and, in many cases, their very licenses, instead, comments concentrated on the no-code communicator class. Amateurs were overwhelmingly against it. In fact, the communicator license received the same amount of contempt and disdain that the hobby class proposal had received a few years back. However, while amateurs were debating the FCC restructuring proposal on the air and in letters to QST, the ARRL was unusually quiet. Why weren't they coming out with a position? The answer in a word was incentive, as in incentive licensing. The ARRL had learned its lesson back in the 1960s when it had submitted its proposal for restrictive phone bans. Now, before any response was made, the ARRL wanted to know exactly what the members wanted. Thus, the League sent out a comprehensive survey to all 100,000 members. 56% or 56,000, myself included, returned the questionnaires. The ARRL tabulated the results, printed them in a multi-page report in QST, and then, in the summer of 1975, submitted their own proposal to the FCC. The ARRL's plan kept the basic amateur structure that was in existence, but with a few changes. The League suggested a basic amateur license, which would provide limited VHF operating privileges. The basic amateur would not actually have to pass a code exam, but would have to be familiar with CW characters. The trick here, of course, is that once someone has memorized the letters, numbers, and basic punctuation marks, they're at five words per minute already. So this wasn't really a no-code license, but it did eliminate formal CW testing. As for technicians, the League once again asked that they no longer be burdened with the experimenter designation, that they receive novice HF subbands, and that they receive full VHF privileges. Generals would see their code requirement drop to 10 words per minute, while the advanced class would be bumped up to 15 words per minute. No major changes were proposed for the extra class. Unlike the 1960s, when the ARRL was blasted for shoving incentive licensing at the members, this proposal was met with overall approval and appreciation from amateurs. In the end, although the FCC dropped the dual ladder idea, they did incorporate many of the ARRL's ideas into future rule changes. Technicians were mainstreamed into the amateur license structure. Novices received expanded privileges to eventually include HF and VHF phone. And the FCC, after years of restrictive proposals, finally chose the path of gradual deregulation. But the dual ladder story was not the only event of 1975. When amateurs weren't arguing over the evils of the communicator class, they were blasting the idea of Class ECB. What is it? In summary, the Electronics Industry Association, or EIA, proposed taking up the 2 MHz of our 220 band and turning it over to a new CB service. With 25 kHz spacing between the channels, the new EIA Class ECB could have as many as 80 channels. The EIA claimed that the 23-channel CB band at 27 MHz was impossibly overcrowded and worthless for local communications among legitimate users. Remember, this was at the same time of the gas crisis and the CB boom. The EIA argued that a skip-free area was needed for CB and that the 220 band was underutilized by hams. The EIA's proposals, in fact, were quite stringent and, had it not been for their unfortunate choice of frequencies, they may have received the support of the ARRL. But the EIA was trying to mix matter and antimatter, in this case, amateur frequencies and CB. This had happened once before in 1958 when Class D CB was created out of our 11 meter band. Never again was the cry from hams. The explosion of protest from the amateur community was palatable. Amateurs pointed out that CB wouldn't be such a mess if everyone obeyed the Part 95 rules and the FCC took some enforcement action. 
The ARRL stated that the CBers themselves were opposed to 220 megahertz CB, which was only partially true. The only CB operators surveyed were those who read hobby-type magazines such as S9. They were opposed to anything that would take them away from the skip and DX zone into a tightly regulated land of local communications. Lost in the emotional shuffle was the logical point that CB did not belong in the HF spectrum. In the end, with the strong opposition of the ARRL and the indifferent support of CBers who really wanted to stay on HF, the FCC dropped the idea. Instead, in late 1976, the FCC expanded the CB ban from 23 to 40 channels and prohibited the sale of the older 23 channel units. This created a mini bonanza for hams who snapped up the obsolete 23 channel units at fire sale prices and converted them to 10 meters. As a postscript, amateurs did lose 2 megahertz of our 220 band in the early 1990s. These frequencies are now a no man's land, unused. Which is better, to lose 2 megahertz to a service that hams and their families could use productively, or to lose it to something that is inaccessible and doesn't even exist yet? In our next installment, we will look at the war protest movement in 1970 and how it affected amateur radio. I hope you will join me. Region 1 of the International Amateur Radio Union, which includes Europe, has started preparations for a workshop to look at the future of amateur radio. IARU Region 1 is working with its member societies. The message being shared in this session is clear. IARU societies are losing members. Loss in members in some societies is remarkable in the last 10 years, even with good examination throughput. Next to this, persons in leadership roles in these societies are getting older. Not all member societies have top team members under the age of 35. The IARU Region 1 Executive Committee says it believes that it's time for change and we need to start moving forward, working together and changing the current trends. We need to refocus our thinking and way of operating. The main questions and topics which will be covered in the workshop are what is amateur radio today? How is it changing? Where are tomorrow's radio amateurs? How do others see amateur radio? And what do we need to do for the future? Member societies are called upon to take part by nominating people with future-orientated mindsets and prepare for this workshop. Key will be to include new people into the discussion, hoping to reach new ideas and new ways of thinking. The workshop, called Facing the Future, is scheduled to be held in October 2021, hopefully in Novi Sad, Serbia, hosted by the Serbian Amateur Radio Society, the SRS. And a virtual alternative workshop will be prepared as well. You can find out more at iaru-r1.org. Foundations of Amateur Radio the landscape of remotely operated amateur radio is changing by the day. Once the territory of homebrew DTMF decoders and remote controlled radio links, now more often than not it's a Raspberry Pi with an internet connection or some variation on that. Before I continue, I must point out that amateur regulations vary widely around the globe, especially in this area. It appears mostly due to the rapidly changing nature of remotely operated radios. For example, most, if not all, software-defined radios are technically remotely operated. You run software on your computer, the radio is connected to a network, you twiddle a setting on your computer and the radio responds. The computer is not part of the radio, but without it there's not much radio to be had. There's no need for both to be in the same room, let alone the same building. Similarly, a Kenwood TS-480 and a Yaesu FT-857D are both radios that have a removable face with knobs and a display. The main body of the radio is a nondescript box with sockets for power and antenna, connected to the face essentially via a serial cable that can be a few centimetres long or a few metres. There are solutions like Remote Rig that replace this serial cable with a virtual cable, allowing you to put the face in one location and the body in a different one, connected to each other across the internet. With the introduction of Starlink Internet, a low Earth orbit satellite based network, a connection to the internet can be made anywhere on Earth, making it possible to have your station sitting somewhere far away from interference, 
powered by batteries and solar panels and connected to the internet. You might not even need to go satellite-based internet. The mobile phone network in many places is often more than sufficient for making such a station viable. If you're a member of a radio club, you might consider your club station. Often this station is the work of many volunteer years' effort, with multiple radios, antennas, filters and the like, and often it sits idle most of the time, only getting fired up during club meetings or the weekend. What if you connected that station to the internet and offered it as a service to your members? Depending on license requirements, you might consider amateurs who have limited ability to build a shack, but would love to be on air making noise. A remote club shack might be just the ticket for getting them on air. It could even become an income stream for your club. You might be able to offer access to trainees or let them monitor the station without transmit ability whilst they're preparing for their license. Or you might operate a 48-hour contest in shifts, all using the same transmitter but from the comfort of your home. The landscape is full of different solutions, like Remote Rig, which I've already mentioned. RigPi, Remote Station Server, is a tiny computer that controls your radio and allows you access via a web browser or remote desktop connection. There's Remote Hams, a ready-made solution for putting your shack on air with access control and remote management. You can connect specific radios like the Elecraft K3 remote system or a Flex Radio Maestro. There's even web browser remote control projects like Universal Ham Radio Remote by Oliver Foxtrot 4 Hotel Tango Bravo, each making it possible to get on air and make noise using a radio in a different location across the internet. All of the solutions I've named make it possible to fully use your radio. That means CW, SSB, FM, antenna control and the like. You can use it for FT8 or RITI. The choice is yours. The interface might be the face of your radio, a special console, computer, phone or a tablet and you can operate it wherever and whenever the mood takes you. No longer do you need to have a shack in your home with coax snaking through the walls to an antenna whilst dodging the local authorities or fighting the engine noise from your car. You can make the ultimate shack anywhere without taking up space in your home or car. One final comment. This is a moving feast. The level of functionality is increasing by the day. For me, this journey started with a steel toolbox in my garage with a radio inside it and coax running from the box to my antenna. I have operated my radio and hosted my weekly net like this. The radio in the garage, me and my office connected via Wi-Fi over a virtual serial cable. You don't need to start this in the middle of nowhere six hours drive over the back roads to fix a problem. You can start this project today at home. Where on this journey are you and what issues have you come up against? Let me know. My address is always is cq at vk6flab.com. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. In preparation for the forthcoming edition of Electromagnetic Field Record Keeping to the UK Amateur Licence, a new version of the RSGB Ofcom EMF Calculator version 9C is available for free download on the RSGB EMF page. Ofcom have produced a guidance document explaining what radio amateurs need to know about the new EMF licence condition. It includes a handy compliance flowchart that shows you step by step what you need to do to carry out your station assessment. The first step is to determine your station's EIRP. The RSGB's calculator will help to work this out and give you the required average EIRP value. If this value is 10 watts or less, then all you need to do for the assessment is to record the calculated value, nothing else. It is thought that a significant number of amateur HF stations will find their average EIRP value is 10 watts or less, and if so, the safe compliance distance doesn't apply. If the EIRP is greater than 10 watts, then you'll need to follow the other steps in the flowchart. Read Ofcom's What You Need to Know as an Amateur Radio User by going to ofcom.org.uk and seeking out the draft PDF guide. A lot of information about the new license condition and the new version of the calculator can be found at rsgb.org forward slash EMF. Mark your calendars because World Amateur Radio Day 2021 is Sunday, April 18th. On that day in 1925, the International Amateur Radio Union was formed in Paris. 
Today, the IARU is a worldwide federation of national amateur radio organizations. The IARU has chosen amateur radio, home but never alone, as its World Amateur Radio Day 2021 theme, acknowledging the many ways throughout the pandemic that amateur radio has remained a welcome respite for its variety of activities and opportunities, even helping overcome online fatigue and social isolation. The ARRL has information to help all radio amateurs start planning for World Amateur Radio Day. The 2021 Com Academy, by the way, is scheduled for April 10th and 11th. This will be two days of training, talks, and information on emergency communication and amateur radio. This year's theme for 2021 Com Academy is disasters here, there, and everywhere. Are we ready? Registration is free and required to gain access to the complete schedule and Academy materials. The Academy is entirely virtual and hosted online. Headquartered in Seattle, Washington, Com Academy is attended and supported by organizations including the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, Auxiliary Communication Service, the EOC Support Teams, Civil Air Patrol, Coast Guard Auxiliary, REACT, and CERT, among many others. Anyone interested in emergency and amateur radio communications are welcome to network and share experiences. The event focuses on education for communications leaders, volunteers, and professionals. Once again, that's Com Academy 2021. In the UK, the RSGB Contest Committee has announced that it will accept portable entries in contests by stations in England from March the 29th. The RSGB commented that, as usual, when approaching a significant change in the COVID restrictions in England, they started to receive some queries about how this will impact portable contesting. The RSGB is continuing to apply the principle of simply requiring stations to strictly follow their local COVID restrictions and advisories. Therefore, from the 29th of March, as the stay-at-home restriction is removed in England, they will once again accept portable entries from stations in England. Portable multi-operator entries must normally be from the same household or bubble. Typical portable locations, campervans, cars and tents, are considered indoors and indoors mixing of households is still not allowed. You can read the full announcement on the RSGB contest website at www.rsgbcc.org. It's time for the weekly propagation report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports on March 21st and 22nd, two new sunspot groups, 2811 and 2812, appeared. Average daily sunspot numbers this week faded a bit from 19 to 17.9, but average daily solar flux went from 78.1 to 78.6. Neither change is significant. We haven't seen a day with no sunspots since March 1st, so that brings the percentage of spotless days so far this year to 38%, down from 57% last year and 77% in 2019. Geomagnetic activity was steady throughout the week, with average planetary A indices rising from 10.3 to 13.3, and the average middle latitude A index rose from 7.3 to 10.4 but geomagnetic conditions were disturbed at higher latitudes. For example, Alaska's College A index measured near Fairbanks was 40 and 45 on March 20th and 21st. This was reflected in a report from N6QEK stroke KL7 in North Pole, Alaska, a town southeast of Fairbanks, not at the North Pole, who wrote HF frequencies here in the interior of Alaska were wiped out for RTTY contesting and FT8 signals were almost non-existent as well. Saturday was the first day of spring in the Northern Hemisphere and the first day of fall in the Southern Hemisphere, positive indications for HF propagation. The predicted solar flux over the next couple of weeks is 80 on March 26th and 27th, 75 on March 28th to the 31st, 70 on April 1st and 2nd, 80 and 81 on April 3rd and 4th, 82 on April 5th and 7th, and 81 on April 8th. The predicted planetary A index will be 8 on March 26th, 5 on March 27th, 25 on March 28th, 20 on March 29th and 30th, 12 on March 31st, 8 on April 1st to the 3rd, 5 on April 4th to the 7th, and 15, 18, and 20 on April 8th to the 10th. 
Time now for the AMSAT report. In the January-February issue of the AMSAT Journal, AMSAT President Robert Bankston, KE4AL, made these comments in his editorial. With respect to FM crossband repeaters, he said it's imperative to determine how to find a way to provide a sustained presence of FM crossband repeaters in low Earth orbit without taking away from current plans to return to high Earth orbits. Regarding AO7's coming back to life after its batteries failed, Bankston said AMSAT needs to design electrical power systems so that when the batteries fail, the radios are still powered by the solar panels when not in eclipse. Another challenge for AMSAT is not to have another FM crossband repeater in its inventory to use for a future satellite that includes discontinued components. AMSAT is working on procuring a new open design for not only its needs, but to share with the rest of the world, Bankston said. The AMSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 has started preparations for a workshop to look at the future of amateur radio. The IARU Region 1 site says, what is amateur radio today? How is it changing? Where are tomorrow's amateurs? How do others see amateur radio? What do we need to do for the future? On Wednesday, March 24th, IARU Region 1 started preparing together with its member societies a workshop with focus on the future of amateur radio. The message being shared in this session is clear. IARU societies are losing members. Loss in members in some societies is remarkable in the last 10 years, even with good examination throughput. Next to this, persons in leadership roles in these societies are getting older. Not all member societies have top team members under the age of 35 years. The IARU Region 1 Executive Committee shares that it's time for change and we need to start moving forward, working together and changing the current trends. We need to refocus our thinking and way of operating. Main questions and topics which were to be covered in the workshop are, what is amateur radio today? How is it changing? Where are tomorrow's radio amateurs? How do others see amateur radio? What do we need to do for the future? Member societies are called upon to take an active part by nominating people with a future-oriented mindset. Key will be to include new people into the discussion, hoping to reach new ideas and new ways of thinking. The workshop Facing the Future is scheduled to be held in October 2021, hopefully in Novi Sad, Serbia, hosted by SRS, the Serbian Amateur Radio Society. A virtual alternative workshop will be prepared as well. Years ago, a mysterious signal dubbed the Ditter showed up on 20 meters. The transmissions turned out to be unintentional. Now, the IARU Region 1 Monitoring System February newsletter reports that mysterious groups of dashes, sometimes 5, sometimes 16, sometimes continuous, are being transmitted over long periods daily at or around 7075 kilohertz, a segment of 40 meters typically occupied by FT8 operators. So far, no one's been able to pinpoint the source of the transmissions. The dasher aside, over-the-horizon radars continue to be the biggest source of interference in the HF amateur bands. A number station continues to be heard Wednesdays on 7062 kilohertz and 14280 kilohertz. The voice is female, speaking Russian. The signal is believed to belong to the Ukraine Security Service. The broadcasting station's voice of broad masses and VOBM2 from Iridia continue to cause interference daily at 7140 and 7180 kHz. Another station at 7200 kHz, believed to be National Unity Radio, also broadcasts daily from 1100 to 1300 UTC. Some sad news to report this week as the world of shortwave listening enthusiasts has lost one of its longtime leaders tragically in a house fire in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland.com said the victim was George Zeller. 
Zeller was a radio hobbyist since the early 60s, spent decades reporting on hundreds of pirate radio operators and other shortwave stations. His column had an active following in the journal, the monthly publication of the North American Shortwave Association. He was a contributing editor to a number of other radio publications and a longtime contributor to the publication of the Association of Clandestine Radio Enthusiasts. George is also a popular host of the Pirate Radio Forum at the annual Winter SWL Fest since its early years. His reputation earned him an induction into the North American Pirate Radio Hall of Fame in 2011. His personal website, georgezeller.com, gives the details on what he considered to be his best QSL verification letter in all his years of radio listening. It was a confirmation from the FCC that he'd copied the enforcement action on the air of WHBH Radio in February of 1990. By profession, George was an economist who carefully watched his home state's financial health and was quoted often in the mainstream media. His other love was sports, particularly baseball and football. According to the Cleveland.com website, the fire department determined the blaze was set off by an overloaded extension cord. George Zeller was 71 years old. To commemorate the 117th anniversary of the arrival of Italian settlers and the foundation of the locality of Capitan Pastene in southern Chile, which was also known initially as Nova Italia, look out for the following stations to be active until March the 28th. India India 4 Charlie Papa Charlie is being operated by the Associazione Radio Amatori Italiani from Modena, Italy. Lima Uniform 6 Delta Kilo Stroke Delta is being operated by the Radio Club Dolores, Buenos Aires, Argentina. And Charlie Bravo 6 India is being operated by the Radio Club Triguen in Chile. Three special certificates will be available. Search for the relevant call signs on QRZ.com to find out more information and QSL details. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. The only thing that worries me more than climbing to 400 feet on a July night with thunderstorms visible in the distance is climbing to 200 feet and then making a turn to the right and moving away from the tower six feet on a sidearm. Just the thought of making a sharp turn on a highway with no exits just doesn't seem natural. But for a climber, it's a necessary part of the job. For the safety-oriented climber, we work to minimize the risk of death. Let's be honest here. If something goes very wrong on a sidearm, one of three things will happen. Death, poopy diapers, or serious injury. Let's examine some potential truths about sidearms. For openers, if the sidearm was about to fall off the tower, it would be visibly obvious just by looking at its mounting hardware most of the time. Also, if that structure survived the past year's worth of ice storms, 90 mile an hour winds, or worse without breaking, chances are it'll support my fat butt for a short amount of time just fine too. Since tower climbers usually own lots of straps, belts, and ropes, we have the ability to choose how we want to protect ourselves when working on sidearms. Basically, we can choose to secure ourselves to the tower or if we want to secure ourselves to the sidearm at all. Depending upon the width of the tower, the design of the sidearm will vary. On a one to two foot sidearm, many times I stay below it and stay strapped to the tower. I use two or three devices and lean out away from the tower so I'm just below the antenna I'm working on. If the antenna is too heavy to handle this way, I can secure from above or work on it from above. If the sidearm is a big six foot mother, I prefer to climb out onto it to get my work done. What I do is use a very light but very strong rescue strap. It's about 10 feet long and strong enough to pull a car out of a ditch, yet light enough to carry in a big pocket. I attach it with two beaners about 5 feet above the sidearm on that side of the tower. The other end of the strap goes to my belt. I slide out onto the sidearm and often never strap onto it. Depending upon the width of the sidearm and the weight of the antenna I'm working on, I may never strap onto the sidearm at all. This way, if the sidearm breaks off the tower, I'll drop to the end of the strap and stop while the sidearm can fall away. If I was strapped to the sidearm too, my strap would have to catch all of that weight, which sounds like a bad idea to me. Again, each installation is different. One needs to know the age of the structure and look how well maintained it is and decide how to deal with safety based on a first-hand inspection of the sidearm. 
There's not much in nature that would put an equivalent weight load at the end of a sidearm equal to my 160 pound body weight. So a climber needs to be very aware of the risks and safety specs of his gear, not to mention the condition of the tower. The professional climber recognizes the danger and works to minimize the risk without losing lots of time and with minimal added weight. If you want to imagine a job I don't ever want is the guy that slides down the guy wires with the bucket of grease smearing a coating from end to end. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, which are a member's only benefit. Visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar page to register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions. The Art and Science of Operating Ultra Portable, presented by Mike Molina, KN6 EZE, will be held on Tuesday, April 6th, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern. That's 0 UTC on Friday, April 7th. Ultra portable operation is quickly growing in popularity, whether for SOTA, POTA, backcountry survival, or just spending time in nature. Learning how to operate ultra portable is a fun and rewarding experience. In this presentation, Mike, KN6 EZE, covers the basics for new and experienced ham radio operators. Finding and fixing radio frequency interference hosted by Paul Cianciello, W1VLF, RFI engineer at ARRL Laboratory is scheduled for Tuesday, April 20th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Radio frequency interference from natural and man-made sources has been a problem for hams and shortwave listeners since the radio hobby began. Things have changed in the last 20 years with the advent of widespread solar power, LED lighting, grow lights, and computers. Learn all about finding and fixing RFI in today's world. HF Noise Mitigation, hosted by ARRL Northwestern Division Director Mike Ritz, W7VO, is scheduled for Thursday, April 22nd, 2021 at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, that's 1930 UTC. An educational seminar to help new and experienced amateurs who are on HF and finding themselves plagued with noise. We'll learn what noise is, talk about the various noise sources, and discuss how to mitigate those noises using a variety of techniques. As always, remember that the ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change, and you should check the Learning Network webinar webpage for the latest information. In Wales, John, Mike Whiskey One Charlie Foxtrot November will be active as Golf Bravo 1004 Foxtrot Tango Sierra from Anglesey Island, that's Echo Uniform 005, an island off the mainland's northwest coast between March the 25th and April the 8th. Operation will be on various HF bands including 6 and 2 meters using single sideband and the digital modes. The activity is to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Royal Air Force's No. 4 Flying Training School, which opened on April 1, 1921. You can QSL via Mike Whiskey One, Charlie Foxtrot November, direct. The Ogden Amateur Radio Club in Utah is celebrating its 100th anniversary as an organized club. In May of 1921, Dr. W.G. Garner, W7EW, and five others gathered to establish the club, and Garner was elected president. The Ogden Amateur Radio Club now uses the last call sign he held, W7SU, as an in-memoriam club station call sign. The Ogden Amateur Radio Club has been an ARRL-affiliated club since 1937. Its current president is Dave Mamanakis, KD7GR, while Gil Leonard, NG7IL, heads the Centennial Committee. The observance will include a special event station in May to mark the driving of the last Spike Railroad commemoration at Promontory Point, Utah, and other activities all around Ogden. A gift of emergency batteries provided to amateur radio operators in the highest hazard zone of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has put those stations back on the air. The 12-volt batteries provided through the country's General Services Office has enabled hams to get on the air in the nation's northernmost settlement of Fancy and in Rose Hall, the settlement with the highest altitude. The amateur stations are both in the red zone, a highly hazardous region because of its proximity to a volcano. 
Officials regularly monitor activity at the San Sufrier volcano in the north, where an activity known as effusive eruption has been noted in recent weeks. The hams received the batteries at the request of the Rainbow League president, Yulo Movement. The director, Donald D. Riggs, J88CD, made that request on behalf of Elna Michael, J88NEK, of Fancy and Percy Lampkin, J88NEB of Rose Hall. According to the news report of the Searchlight VC website, the station in Fancy now maintains contact with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and the station in Rose Hall has been checking into local and regional nets. Leaving a small footprint on sensitive natural areas can be a challenge for de-expeditions. George Waldner, AA7JV, who will be operating as C6AGU from Deepwater Key in the Bahamas until March 30th, including during the CQ Worldwide WPX SSB weekend, will be testing a de-expedition setup that may be more amenable to concerns of environmental protection agencies that oppose camping on protected land. Radio gear in a weatherproof box is installed on land along with antennas. In some places, landing permits, rather than the cost of a de-expedition, are the biggest obstacles. Often, overnight stays are not allowed, especially hindering 160-meter operations. The approach is radio in a box, a complete station in a weatherproof Pelican case containing a Flex 6700 transceiver and an amplifier, along with cooling and control systems. The box, antennas, and generators would be on land and operated remotely from a nearby vessel. The radio in a box is seen as addressing that issue, and Walner believes this lower-profile approach will become the standard for future de-expeditions to sensitive areas. The Northern California DX Foundation and Flex Radio have provided financial support. C6 AGU operators this month will include W6IZT. This team has been testing the radio in a box concept for a year now. The November 2020 operation involved operation from a small, privately owned island in the Bahamas with the gear on shore and the operators on board, running stations during the CQ Worldwide DX contest from the comfort of the vessel's flybridge. This particular operation deployed four individual radio-in-a-box systems connected to a common network. The ship-to-shore link was carried out on 900 megahertz with a ubiquity data bridge. The test was considered very successful. Hal Turley, WAHC, has produced a PowerPoint of the November 2020 test operation. He presented it at the February 6th virtual meeting of the West Virginia DX Association, telling his audience that operation with six radio-in-a-box systems on shore is considered possible. And finally this week, if you were beginning in ham radio 50 or so years ago, your amateur radio experience would begin with a novice class license, good for only a year, and you would operate a crystal-controlled 75-watt CW transmitter. Often, these rigs were homebrew, drifted in frequency with chirps and key clicks on the signal. By modern standards, this all sounds archaic, but each year hams from around the country dust off their old rigs, dig out their straight keys, and return to the good old days of yesteryear. This year, there were more than 292 such hams, and they logged 4,300 contacts the old-fashioned way, most of them adhering to novice restrictions. They were part of the annual Novice Rig Roundup, co-chaired by Dan Sands, N7SU, and Doug Tombo, N3PDT. The event, held annually during the third week of February, was established in 2015 by Bry Carling, AF4K, now a silent key. This year's event was a showcase for talking about such now obsolete radios as Heathkit DX40s, Drake and Halicrafters, as well as homebrew rigs with exotic vacuum tubes like 807s and 6146s. Novice Rig Roundup is more than just an annual event. For information and to join in the fun, visit their webpage at novicerigroundup.org. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the Internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland. 
serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.